Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 583 for the 9th of Tomos in a regular year. So imagine that you have this couple, and I apologize in advance if it sounds like I'm being stereotypical in any way of men or women. <laughs> this is a theoretical couple. It's just an example, not anybody real or anybody that you know or anything like that. So imagine that you had this couple, and the husband was constantly messing up in terms of being reliable. He would often come late. Sometimes he wouldn't even show up. And whether it was for an appointment, for an anniversary, for a birthday, for what, whatever it is, he was just always working. And what he would do is he would send flowers to his wife in the hopes that this would make everything better. So imagine, or sometimes he would send chocolate, presents, things like that. So imagine like, let's say it was like one certain evening and the wife, and it was actually their anniversary and the wife prepared this beautiful meal to celebrate their anniversary and she's waiting. It's like 6 PM, 7 PM. He doesn't show up 8 PM. She gets a knock at the door and it's a messenger who sends flowers and the flowers have a note in them that maybe says, sorry, maybe not even <laughs> that just says I'm at the office. I really, I couldn't make it it's so unfortunate. I had too much work to do, but here are some flowers. Hopefully this will make everything better. Hopefully you enjoy them. How do you think this wife would feel? <laughs> not very good, right? All the flowers in the world, all the chocolate in the world, all the presents jewelry in the world is not really going to help her. I mean, assuming that she's a normal uh, kind of person who's looking for a healthy relationship, it's not going to make her feel much better or any better at all, especially if the husband doesn't say sorry. And especially if he keeps doing this over and over and over again, and he doesn't make any signs of rectifying his behavior, of wanting to be better, of feeling regret over the situation, right? So this applies exactly to the realm of tshuva. And this is something that we started talking about yesterday. We started talking about the idea that true tshuva is really very simple. True tshuva, true return to God, after a person messes up in some way, so to speak, after a person sins, does something that's against the will of God, if they want to restore them, themselves, they want to uh, to cleanse themselves of the blemish that they've affected upon themselves, really it's very simple. All they need to do is to stop doing this negative behavior and commit to being better in the future, to decide and uh, make an affirmation that from now on, they are not going to do this bad thing anymore. They're going to be better, right? Just like all the woman really, really wants, she doesn't care about the flowers. She doesn't care about the chocolate. She doesn't care about these things. I mean, they're nice for sure, but really better than all of these things is she really just wants her husband to say, I'm so sorry. I messed up. I will not do it anymore. I'm going to take practical steps in order to be better at this, right? Nevertheless, let's say, let's pick another example of maybe the same couple. Maybe they did some couples therapy and they're working on their marriage and things are working out. And let's say the husband matured a little bit and he learns that, yes, I need to say sorry. Uh, yes, I need to work on myself. I need to resolve to be better in the future. So imagine that he does all these things. This time he does the right things. He he shows up late, but this time instead he does say sorry. This time he does say, I'm re- I really regret this. I'm really, I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore. I, I made sure to set a reminder on my phone. I told my secretary to set these appointments, like just like their work appointments, they're set in stone for me. This isn't going to happen in the future. So imagine he does all those things. And then, so, okay, great. So that's really good. And then imagine that in addition to that, he also sends flowers or he also sends chocolate. That's kind of nice, right? It's not necessary, but it definitely is nice. So it's like picture the woman um, accepting the apology 
without the flowers and a picture of the woman accepting the apology with the flowers and the chocolate. In both situations, she's pretty happy, right? Like she's happy that he apologized. She's happy that he acknowledged his wrongdoing. But in the situation where she gets the chocolate and the flowers together with the apology, it's a little bit nicer. It's a little, she's going to be a little bit more welcoming to him, most likely, right? And it doesn't even matter so much if it's like the specific type of flowers that she likes, the specific type of chocolate that she likes. I mean, of course, those things are make it even better. But it really shows that he made this effort. He really took it to that next level of he's not just acknowledged what he did wrong and wants to be better in the future, but he wants to restore himself into her good graces. He realizes that this might have been very painful for her to be sitting and waiting for him and not knowing where he was and and being kind of feeling disrespected in this kind of way and so she's she feels acknowledged she feels taken care of she feels like oh wow he really he really means it this time and he really wants to be better and she most likely if she's a good wife she will you know accept him with welcome arms so this is the topic of today this is what we're going to be talking about and we're going to translate this in terms of our relationship with God and we're going to talk about what all of this means so what do we mean by this what do we what are the chocolate and the flowers and all of that stuff when it comes to God so back in the day uh, back when we had the base of Megdash, it was actually very concrete. We used to bring very concrete presents to God. These were in the form of sacrifices. So we used to go to the temple after a person, God forbid, would violate one of the commandments, whether it was a positive commandment or a negative commandment, in advert- inadvertently or advertently, they would go to the temple and as and they would bring a sacrifice to God. They would bring they would prepare the sacrifice and and bring it over, give it over to the Kohen and the Kohen would burn it on the altar. And this was considered to be like a present that you were giving to God. Now, to be clear, and this is uh, something important to mention, this didn't absolve the person from doing tshuva. This wasn't even considered to be part of the tshuva process. This was just something that it was like a way to kind of appease God. But this didn't absolve the person from doing their own work, from doing their own internal work to really contemplate and meditate and really think about like what went wrong. Where did they go wrong? How did they sin? How are they not going to do this in the future? Like really do that process of actual tshuva. Uh, And nowadays... We don't bring sacrifices, right? So instead, what has been given instead of sacrifices, as we'll learn, is the idea of fasting. So fasting is something, is a way that we can kind of appease God. So we spoke a little bit about this yesterday, about how often when we do like public fasts and things like that, we see like with the story of the the fast of Esther, this is often a way to kind of like plead with God and to appease God, to nullify some kind of decree that's come upon us or upon our nation as a whole, God forbid, or that kind of thing. But as we said very clearly yesterday, fasting is not tshuva. And people make this mistake. People think that fasting is tshuva. So this reminded me of a Catholic Lahavdil practice, um, something in the Catholic church where people pay in indulgences, they're called, where people, where if somebody... Um, does some kind of sin of some kind, then what they'll do is they can actually pay the church and give money to the church as a kind of way of like absolving them from their sin. So in Judaism, we don't believe in this. In Judaism, we don't believe that you can just like pay somebody off, that you can just like give somebody a gift or even fast and that like takes away your sin. You have to do the work. You have to actually go inside and you have to um, make that internal change and resolve uh, and commitment to be better in the future. That's really what Shuva is, as we keep saying. But nevertheless, we do know, as mentioned, that there is a place for gifts to God. There is a place for sacrifices. There is a place for fasting, all of which fall into that same category. Because like, if you think about it, like when you fast, you're kind of sacrificing your own body, your own flesh to God, right? So it's, there is this idea. So just like in the example that we gave of the husband and the wife, there is a place for him to give gifts to his wife. We're not saying that a husband should never give gifts to his wife. We're not saying that we should never give gifts to God, that we should never fast, that we should never have brought sacrifices. It's just that they have to be placed in the right way and we have to understand um, what their purpose is. So just like in the case of the husband and wife, the purpose of the gifts was not to um, have that husband atone himself of his sin against his wife, but rather it's to give that extra level of appeasement for him to be back in the good graces with his wife. So too, our sacrifices and nowadays fasting can be thought of it in the same way. When we fast or when we brought sacrifices back in the day, that isn't the, that isn't tshuva. That's not what tshuva is. Tshuva is that regret and that resolve to do better in the future. 
and that resolve to do better in the future and regret over the past, that literally does um, cleanse the person from any, any blemish of the sin. They're good. They're good to go now. But then even though they're good to go and they no longer have that like spiritual blemish upon them, if they really want to be back in God's graces, like in a favorable way, they need, it's, it's good for us to bring God some kind of present. So back in the day, that present was a sacrifice of some kind. And nowadays it's fasting. And as we'll actually learn further on in Tanya, it's not even fasting nowadays because we, the, but this is a little bit skipping ahead, but there's this idea that we're actually not as strong as we used to be in terms of being able to fast as much as people used to fast. So uh, the substitute for fasting nowadays is actually giving charity, which is uh, which is connected in a, in a certain way too, but we're going to learn about that later. So for today, we're really starting with that baseline of, of the sacrifices and how that led into fasting really. So let's get into the text. And for context, we are in Igera Sechuva, a relatively new safer that we just started a couple days ago. And we're going to be learning the entirety of chapter two today of this safer. So the altar of it begins, and he references back to the previous chapter, which talks about this idea that really emphasizing how fasting is not shuva. Shuva, again, I keep repeating myself, but it's a very important point. Shuva is really as simple as just um, regretting what you did and resolving to not do that thing in the future, that sin in the future. So the altar of it says now, beginning this ch ch this chapter, he says that while this is true, this idea of the, what tshuva is and what it's not, this has to do with atonement and forgiveness for sin, which is has now been totally forgiven for the person on the fact that the person um, transgressed the will of the king. And the fact that if, if a person really does this full tshuva, if they really have this really full resolve to be better in the future, to not sin in the future, then they are 100% forgiven, 100% atoned. And we don't remind them anything about this. Like there's no accusation men mentioned against him at the day of judgment. So after a person um, passes away, they're not reminded about their sin because they've done, they did their due diligence and they really repented. And this true tshuva can actually absolve a person of having um, really any kind of trial, any kind of judgment in the next world. However, if a person wants to be acceptable before God and like beloved to God, just like he was before, like so that there aren't any bad feelings and like to really give Hashem nachas, like to, to really make Hashem feel good, then for this, we would bring a korban ola. So a korban ola, or in, or in English, we call it a burnt offering, was a certain type of offering that was that was brought in the base of Megadesh when we had the, the temple. And it was burnt in its entirety on the altar, which is what made it unique and different from some of the other sacrifices. But uh, yeah, but basically, even for a very minor positive commandment that a person violated, like just if somebody neglected to do a very minor positive commandment, which was not punishable by exition or by death at the hands of uh, of the basin of the court, then even for these very minor kind of sins, we were required to bring a korban ola. As our sages of blessed, blessed memory taught in the Sefer Taras Kohanim, uh, on the verse from Vayikra, and this is from Vayikra chapter 1, verse 4, where it, where it says, yado al rosh haola lo chaper, That you shall lay a hand upon the head of the burnt offering, that it may be acceptable in your behalf uh, in order to atone for you. So basically, the, the basic idea here is that the altar was teaching us that the reason why we would bring this korban ola uh, after committing some kind of sin is in order to like restore ourselves to the good graces uh, for God. And so then the altar goes on and he says that we also find in the Gemara in the first chapter of Zvachim on page seven B that an Ola um, atones for a mitzvah's ase and it's a gift that is given after, um, after one did shuva and after they've been forgiven for the sin. So basically, so it's like the, the pro process again is that let's say if somebody uh, neglects to do some kind of pro positive commandment, first they do shuva and then after they do shuva and after they're forgiven, then they bring that present. So again, to go back to that introductory example with the husband and wife, so the, if the, the husband should not just first buy the flowers for his wife. The, the correct proper procedure is for him to first say he's sorry, to first regret his mistake, um, tell her that he won't do it again and how much uh, and how he's resolving to be better in the future. Then he needs to wait for him, for her to forgive 
forgive him first. So it's not like, oh, she's not forgiving him. So let me just buy her the flowers anyways. Maybe that will convince her. No, no, no. He needs to keep working at it. Keep apologizing. Keep working on himself until she forgives him. And only after she forgives him, then the best thing to do is to buy her the flowers or the chocolate at that point. And so now the altar over here brings his own examples, not the example of the husband and wife, but the, uh, the example of somebody who displeases a king, a physical king. So imagine if somebody does something that displeases the king. So first they're going to want to uh, make sure that the king, that they're, they're forgiven by the king. Like then they do this through different messengers and things like that. And after they know that they were forgiven by the king, then they will send it a, uh, a gift to the king and why are they sending the gift to the king because it's order, in order to like restore himself into his good graces good graces so that the uh the king will agree to see him again to um you know because it could be that even if the king like forgives him there still might be some like bad feelings just like again in the case of the husband and wife even though okay she forgives him it's good whatever she might still be hurt you know there might be a little bit of hurt lingering so the gift is a way to kind of like restore those good graces to erase that hurt as best possible obviously right okay so now the altar rabbi here in brackets he asks a question and or he he answers a possible challenge that a person might have here is if you look at that verse about um from Vayikra, where it says vinil, that it will be acceptable to Hashem, it does say, the full verse says, and you shall lay a hand upon the head of the burnt offering that it may be acceptable in your behalf as a way of atoning for you. So the word atoning is there. So a person might think, wait a second, that sounds like this gift is atoning a person in some way. So what's that talking about? And so the altar explains, this is not the atonement of the soul, of the soul but rather it's an atonement before God so that God will have a good feeling to restore the, those good graces um, with a person to God. So we're atoning our relationship with God. It's not that we're atoning our souls. That's what tshuva does. So tshuva atones the blemish that's on your soul. But then this present, this um, sacrifice is a way of atoning the relationship, making um, making there be no hard feelings, as is explained in the Gemara there, says the Alter Rebbe. And also, as is written, and this is a verse from Vaikra, chapter 22, verse 21, where it says, Tamim yelatson, meaning that it shall be perfect so that it be acceptable, that the, the sacrifice needs to be perfect in order for it to be acceptable. So it's all about being acceptable, acceptable before God. It's not about like erasing the blemish in our souls because that's been taken care of already through our tshuva process. And now the altar goes on and he says that we don't have sacrifices nowadays. So what do we do instead of sacrifices nowadays in order to bring back this like good graces with God to, to, to make ourselves be like, uh, desirable to God. Uh, we, we have fasting and fasting takes the place of the sacrifices as it is written in the Gemara. Uh, and this is taken from Brachos page 17a where it says that may my loss of fat and blood be regarded as though I had offered it to you as a sacrifice on the altar. So like literally when you're fasting, you're really giving your blood, your flesh is really, you're giving it over to God. So it's, it's very similar to a sacrifice in this way. And so this is why we see that many Tanaim and Amoraim, different Talmudic sages, that they would fast even for very minute kind of things. And they would actually fast a lot for this. So they really this was why they were fasting. It was in order to, this was their way of giving a present to God the, to restore themselves to the good graces. And then the altar gives a couple of examples here. Um, one example, or he gives three examples, actually. The first example is from the Talmud Yerushalmi in Beta 2.8, where Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah, so he held that he permitted the idea. It's a very obscure kind of example, but this is what the altar brings. So he permitted that a, uh, a cow can go out on Shabbos uh, wearing its strap between its horns, whereas his colleagues said this is not allowed. And one day, one of the neighbor's cows went out with its strap between its horns, which is what Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah said was okay. And Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah didn't protest because he felt like it was okay. But just because he didn't support his colleague's view, for this, he fasted so long that his teeth were blackened. 
So it's like such a minute thing that like maybe possibly, you know, like he just because even though he felt that the the person, the cow wasn't doing anything wrong and was totally fine because he wasn't supporting his the view of his, the majority of his colleagues, then he um, then he fasted for this. And we also see in the case of um, Rabbi Yoshua, and this is taken from Masachat Chagiga, page 22b, that he said, Bosheni midvrechem beit shamay that I am ashamed of your words, Beit Shammai. So it's like he he kind of didn't speak so nicely to Beit Shammai. For this too, he also got black teeth. His teeth blackened through so many fasts that he did. Then another example that the Alter Rebbe gives, this is from Moed Katan, page 25a, where we see that Rav Hona, one day, um, he his that his tefillin strap turned over <laughs> like it just turned over the tefillin strap so it was on backwards and for this he he fasted 50 fasts and there are so many instances like this recorded and amongst the sages so we see that there's this base there's this strong basis for fasting and again fasting is not shuva per se but it's a way of af- of you know after you did shuva and after you you uh, regretted the sin and you hopefully we're forgiven by God. It's a way of restoring your good graces to God. And the Arizal taught his students, according to the Chochmat HaEmet, it's called according to the Kabbalah, different numbers of fasts for all kinds of different sins and violations. So he actually made this into like kind of like a science of like he sort of taught his students how many fasts you should do for different kinds of sins. Um even if these sins were not so severe that they uh, that they ca- they fell into the category of, of punishment by excision or death by the hands of heavens or anything like that. So, for example, he, there are some he's are, these are some examples of the altar begins. So, for anger, for example, the uh, the Arizal um, prescribed 151 fasts. And then even for rabbinical prohibitions. So like, for example, like drinking the wine of non-Jews, like there's an idea that you can't drink wine that was touched or poured or moved by a non-Jew. So for that, said the Arizal, that a person needs to fast 73 fasts. And, uh, and there are other examples like this too, or also for neglecting a positive uh, rabbinical commandment. So for example, prayer, like let's say if a person forgets to pray or doesn't pray like for whatever reason for this they need to fast 61 fasts so as a general rule says the altar Rebbe, the secret of fasting is a very great wondrous mystery um, in order to reveal the supernal will of god so there's something very powerful about fasting so even though fasting as we learned yesterday is not the category it's not it's not we can't define it as being part of tshuva. Nevertheless, there's something very, very, very powerful about fasting. Um, and it's, and it's similar. The power of a fast is similar to that of a sacrifice, um, about which what, it, what is said about a sacrifice. And this is from Vayikra chapter one, verse 13. It says, that this is a pleasing aroma to God. And also in Yeshayahu, we also see in chapter 58, verse five, where it says, Hashem." which literally means you call this a fast and a day desirable to God. So meaning to say that um, that an acceptable fast is considered to be a desirable day. So there's something about fasting, which is similar to a sacrifice like we used to give in the temple, that really is very desirous to God. There's something very, very, very powerful about it. So that's the end of the section. And so just to kind of bring it all together. So once again, just to, and I might sound very, um, repetitive and but it's just to bring the point home fasting is not uh is not shuva it's not shuva it's shuva and shuva again is sim- is as simple as stop doing what the negative behavior regret it and move on and resolve to be better in the future and then hopefully if you do this enough then hashem will forgive you and then only after you're forgiven then comes the idea of fasting or in the past it was sacrifices and the purpose of the fast and the purpose of the sacrifice is not to restore the to remove the blemish on your soul because that's been done through tshuva but it's to restore you into good graces with your relationship with god it's to make god happy it's for god's sake so the tshuva we can think of as for ourselves it's for our own souls to um to cleanse our souls but the the sacrifices or the fasting is for god so just like again let's go back to the let's bring it back home to the introduction in the case of the husband and wife Lahavdiel. so him uh apologizing and and 
deciding, um, committing to being better in the future. So while yes, that's going to make his wife happy, obviously, it's really more about him. It's really more about him correcting himself and refining himself versus then after he's done that and after his wife sees that he's changed, she's really changed and he really resolved to be better in the future, then he can bring her a present of some sort. And that's not really for him. It's not like, it's not, that's the present, the flowers, the chocolate, whatever, that's not going to make him necessarily into a better person or make him be more reliable, but it is going to make her happy. It's going to make her feel better about the whole situation. So that's it for today. And tomorrow we're going to move forward and we're going to begin chapter three and I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzhak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.